Hello and welcome to our series, Leaders in Medicine. Today it's a great pleasure to be here at the University of Cape Town Medical School, where I'm pleased to introduce you to some women role models in medicine who are certainly leading change. I'd like to introduce you to the three colleagues on either side of me here. Cynthia Sikakana. Cynthia is a biochemist, but she leads the programme on student development here at the University of Cape Town Medical School. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you. And Janet Segge. Janet leads on curriculum development here at the medical school. Welcome, Janet. Welcome. And also we have Dr. Nonklanklo Kumalu, who is a consultant dermatologist here at the medical school. Thank you all very much for joining me. There are clearly many challenges here in South Africa, those of developing medical education, developing a programme of, of the MBBS itself here, but also of developing people to deliver a health care in the face of multicultural environment and multi or multiple health care requirements in different areas. I think it could we talk about what is the role of a doctor? Janet, when you're thinking of how you're developing these students, where do you see your end product? What should a doctor look like here in South Africa in the 21st century? Well, as you've pointed out already, the challenges are extraordinary, but the opportunities exist, and indeed that is what the curriculum transformation process offered to transform our medical program so as to produce doctors fit for purpose, mm -hmm. fit for practice within the environment that you've discuss discussed. Um, we are, I think, enormously wealthy in many ways. That is to say, we have our diverse cultural uh, populace, rainbow nation, if you like. We unfortunately have a wealth of pathology upon which to train our patients. I say unfortunately yes. because we haven't yet reached the uh, fortune that Europe and the United Kingdom enjoy. But what that means is that it's relatively easy to train uh, doctors with unusual maturity of clinical skill, unusual maturity in diagnostic ability. And in that we have the diversity of culture in the populations with, him, with whom we serve, we're able to train our students to be culturally aware. And in transforming the curriculum, uh, we knew that we had to develop a curriculum that would be primary healthcare based, community based, because that's where our graduates would end up practicing, and that they would need to learn the languages of the patients uh, whom they treat. And so we were able to build many of those into the structure of the courses that we offered. So we met the challenges as, I think, opportunities for a transformed curriculum and a particularly rich one which will ultimately serve the country. How do you introduce the students to the fact that they are going to have to be leaders of healthcare delivery who are going to have to engage other people because they're obviously in limited, a limited resource themselves? Do you, do you introduce this aspect of managing a healthcare service in the undergraduate curriculum? We do. In year one, we have two courses. Um, called Becoming a Professional, Becoming a Health Professional. Uh, when these aspects and many others are introduced to our students, but perhaps the great strength of those courses is that we have our medical students study alongside physiotherapy, occupational mm -hmm. therapy, speech therapy and audiology students. So that they begin to understand that in fact healthcare delivery is a team affair today and they begin to understand the scope of practice of the other practitioners. And then there are opportunities um, in the more, in the later clinical years 
for the professionals to come together and again work together on projects and so on. It's really exciting. It's quite a new innovation where I come from, but, but one that's critically important in our new style of NHS. Cynthia, I know you've got a critical role here, and one that I'd be interested to hear more about. But here, I've heard a little bit about the programme that you run to develop students. So how, how do you take on students who come from less privileged backgrounds and, but have great potential? How do you bring them on? Well, um, the two issues. I mean, the one that you talk about, the financial issue, I think um, is a problem everywhere. We're fortunate that the university um, does a lot to secure funds in order to provide bursaries for students and um, under the financial aid scheme. And a lot of students pretty much rely on that. And also the government itself um, has provided funds. So a lot of students are on um, Department of Health bursaries, which are great because they are full bursaries covering accommodation and um, tuition and so forth. So each of the provinces provides funds that way. And again, a lot of students are covered. So that's the one aspect. Of course, some students, there's a large number of students who are not poor enough to qualify for financial aid, but need financial assistance. Those are always the tricky ones. So there are students who end up um, accruing loans in the course of their studies. I think the other issue is, um, you were talking about the issue of leadership. I think it's, we're very fortunate because students bring a lot into these programs. So even the students that are considered to come from less privileged um, communities like the rural communities and so forth, they bring leadership with them. And in fact, there are student organizations um, like the Rural Support Network who are, who are actually trying to get students to be interested in working in rural areas because they see a need. So they do actually display a lot of leadership. And in terms of student development and support, the, the support um, comes in different forms. Some of it is academic support, and some of it is non-academic support. The non-academic support is aimed at trying to assist students with whatever problems, financial or otherwise, so that they can actually achieve their aspirations. The issue of um, academic support, um, Janet has just spoken about the development of the curriculum. And in both the old and the new curriculum, part of that development involved providing a part of the curriculum that would enable students from um, less resource schooling who needed additional academic support to, to obtain that. In both cases, both has happened in the old curriculum and has happened in the new, it entails um, the students doing an extra year in order to um, bring in the skills development that is required. And that usually happens in the earliest, like in first year. Um, in, the old, in the new curriculum, it's all done in first year. And in the old, it used to extend into second year. And um, that's you, worked well. Do you